Esther chapter 3, and couldn't help but as we were singing that last song there, um, one of the things that's fascinating to me about the early church is how little they talked about other names. Um, it's interesting, uh, Paul doesn't talk about a lot of the political movers and shakers of his day unless he had to. Uh, even the narrative of Scripture doesn't spend a lot of time talking about the flaws and shortcomings of the world powers of its day. Whose name was it all about? It was about Jesus. And I just want to encourage you with that tonight. That's not living with our heads under a rock or living in denial of what's going on and who the leaders of those threats are, but um, blessed be the name of Christ. Be unto his name, all power and glory and honor. It's a hope that this week that the name of Jesus will be primarily what you focus your energy on. And here's what I found, even for believers, if we don't focus on the name of Christ, we do start focusing on other names, either that we're for or we're against or, hmm, I don't know, whatever, but other names. And so just encourage you to let your heart and mind be centered on the name of Christ and all that that means. Uh, that was a great song there. Esther chapter 3 tonight, and let's pick up our study in verse number 1. We'll read down through verse 6. We will look at the balance of this chapter as well as a few verses in chapter three or chapter 4. But let's begin by setting the table tonight, the first six verses. Esther chapter 3. After these things, <laughs> what things? Well, the things described back in chapter 2, specifically the threat on the king's life and God using Mordecai to be a part of that process. After these things, the king Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of uh, Hamadatha, the Agagite, and av advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. All right, now, oh yes, finally a stand. I love this. Verse 3, then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matter would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. Again, now the stand. Verse 5, and when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath, and he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. So we're looking at tonight stepping up in threatening seasons, which I find very ironic just with the events of this past week, as we all have processed, what if it were us? What if we were there, and what would we do, and would we stand uh, when the threats are leveled against us? Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us tonight. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this day, the kindness of uh, your people in this place to me uh, on this day. I thank you for just your goodness in our lives and letting us see another day, another sunrise, and gathering together, and we again think of those in other places and things they're navigating um, even tonight as they're now under the cloak of darkness and all of the threats and perils and unknowns that they continue to face. We pray that you would just have your will and way in that corner of the world. Pray for us here, Lord, as we face our own set of threats, and whether we do so tonight or not, we will shortly, and we pray that you would help us to prepare for them and to stand for you even when we are threatened by those who do not appreciate what you've called us to do and be as your people. Pray that you would bless um, our study of this text tonight, that we would leave convinced anew and afresh that we're to stand for you, not just when it's easy and convenient, but when there are um, dangers and uh, threats that are leveled against us. Bless this study, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. The other day I saw a picture, uh, a mom that I know, um, and that's a snake. Was somebody wondering what that picture was? I thought I heard that. It's a snake. Um, <laughs> we're a full service ministry here, all right? Um, this this was a picture a mom put of something she's done the last year or so with her child, um, and she put this caption, an idea to keep your kids safe at the grocery store. Um, parents of abduct, uh, she put, posted this, parents of abducted children often say, I only look, I took my eyes off of my child for a second. Uh, sometimes that's all it takes for an abductor to strike. And so they're actually clipping their child, like their belt loop on the back of their pants with one of those speed clips, you know, um, to the, uh, the seat there of the shopping cart. Um, isn't it crazy the day and age in which we live that those are kind of things? I mean, my parents literally, I mean, we were homeschooled, so some of you home, well, they're out in youth group tonight, so I can't make fun of them too directly. A few of our younger kids maybe. 
But I remember dad and mom, we would get our schoolwork done in the morning, and literally we would disappear all day. The neighborhood ra raised each other's kids. It was just a different day. And some of you go back to where you were driving cars at 7 or whatever. You know, you, you guys that really live large as children. But it's just amazing the threats uh, that swirl all around us. And we're just used to them in our day. We've almost normalized uh, what's a part of our fallen and broken world. And I want to begin tonight by making a statement because I think sometimes we think we're standing for Christ when we're not. And here's the statement. We are only really standing, uh, we are not really standing unless we are standing where and when right is being threatened. So we can talk tonight about, well, I stand here and I stand here. My question is, do you stand where there is pushback? Um, and when everybody else is mocking and marginalizing and maybe even attacking our faith, uh, are you willing to stand? And not just stand in the moment, but then deal with the threats that come and the uh, the, the reactions that come when we are faithful to stand uh, for the Lord. I read an article, and I met with some of our men tonight. We're excited about our secret church event, which will be March 25th. If you don't have that on your calendar yet, I jot that down. That'll be from 6.30 to midnight on the last Friday of March. It's so about a month away. And uh, on that evening, we'll be featuring some of the outsiders of church history that were willing to leave the camp and to go outside the camp with Jesus and suffered greatly uh, for the cause of Christ. But I was mentioning to them an article that I read this past week of a Ukrainian pastor who made this statement. Listen to these words. Oh, I love there's still people on the planet, believers that think like this. He said, we have decided to stay in Ukraine, both as a family and as a church. When this is over, the citizens of Kiev will remember how Christians have responded in their time of need. They will remember. And I'm telling you, the next generation will remember not when we stood when it was easy or everybody else was, but when we stood when our faith was threatened, when our own personal safety, uh, when our own convenience was threatened, are we willing to stay and stand in that place? Now, just to bring you up to speed, because we go right from chapter 2 to 3, and if we're not careful, we miss there's been some passage of time. It's very likely that those words that chapter 3 begins with after these things, there's actually five years between the installation of Esther and we know that based on some of the, the, uh, the data as far as dates given in chapter 2. And if you go down to verse number 7, it talks about in the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus. So we know based on what's mentioned in chapter 1 and chapter 2, that likely there's five years between at least the, the installation of Esther um, and now this story we're about to have. So sometimes I think we almost feel Esther's installed and then here comes Haman. But there actually was a gap of time here, um, and then we see now the next uh, phase of the story being uh, introduced to us. And so think of this. For five years, Esther and Mordecai, things were going as planned. They were living in the lap of luxury. Um, that they, they, she was the queen. He was in the king's gate. Everything was clicking. We have to catch that before we get to the crisis, because the threat that was going to come was on the heels of several really good years as it relates to comfort and convenience. They had blended in, as we talked about last week. Their compromise really worked in a lot of ways, humanly speaking. But that's about to be tested now through the events that uh, unravel here in chapter number three. Life was good. Their ethnicity was secret. They were able to enjoy the luxuries of Persia. Everything was going as planned. And yet we see these threats that begin to enter uh, the narrative tonight. So this statement, standing for a feels absent God, must be done by navigating two intense threats. Let's talk about those two in the time we have left. Number one, let's talk about the threat of pressure. The threat of pressure. Now, if we could go back to your high school days, what did the cave to peer pressure look like for you, all right? The version of you that was Mr. or Mrs. Cool, okay? Um, it was funny, last Friday my boys played uh, Geneva, or uh, yes, Genoa Christian in uh, north northern part of Columbus, and, uh, and we were sitting there watching the game, and my wife has a pet peeve. One of the things that's in style right now for young men is they, they don't like their shorts to be long and baggy. I'm of the generation, remember the Michigan, the Fab Five? They were like the ghetto gangsters because they had such baggy, loose shorts. That was like so cool for my 
my generation. That was my era. Now it's the opposite. You know, some of you go back to the era when that was in style the previous time around. You know, mullets are coming back. It's just crazy. The styles of things that, you know, serious in the front, party in the back, or whatever the statement is about mullets, you know. But, but young men now like to wear their short, and so they roll them up. And Heidi, she's nodding. She's about ready to, like, shout out amen here in a second. It drives her crazy. So I, I love it. It's like my favorite part of the game is not my boys. We had a great game in one Friday. It was feeling her squirm beside me like, I'm like, go ahead and just say it. Let it out. You know, this kid needs to, you know, unroll his, his shorts. Um, and then I'm tempted to remind her of the styles in her day. She's of the big hair day. You remember that? Big old wind scoops, you know? Um, she was of that era a few years ahead of me. But it's just funny how peer pressure as adults, sometimes we don't really want to own where it is affecting us. You know, for most of us in the room, regularly we cave to peer pressure. We cave to pressure from social uh, circles and social interactions. And so I want to challenge you tonight, as God's been challenging me, uh, to be willing to step up even during the threat of pressure. All right, let's talk about a couple of them. Number one, we need to stand up in the face of arrogant pressure. So the first place that we see pressure coming from to Mordecai in the text here tonight is the arrogance of those in power uh, during his day. Does that sound familiar? A lot of what's going on in our world right now is just pride. It, it's stripped of all its veneer, its ego, its ambition. And so Mordecai had to deal with the pressures that came from that arrogance. Look back at chapter 1, or chapter 3 and verse 1. After these things, did, t- did King Ahasuerus promote Haman. We'll talk about Haman in a moment, but first of all, let's talk about the king. And I would submit to you, number one, we see Mordecai interacting with arrogant insecurity. The king here, as we've already seen, is a very insecure man. Now, I want you to think about for a moment, why would Ahasuerus hire or install Haman as his second in command? I think if you go back to the verses that precede it in chapter 2 and verse 21 to 23, you have some of the king's closest servants trying to kill him. Uh, They had to have fed his insecurities and and, and caused him to reassess the structure of his his team of leadership. And likely chapter 2, 21 to 23 explains some, if not most, of why Haman was promoted. Haman was probably in the court. He probably already had some access to power. But in this moment, this insecure king uh, installs him over the realm. So you have him rejected by his wife, Vashti. You have now some of his closest circle uh, wanting to kill him. And so he wants to make a statement. And so he responds by hiring what really I think Haman was a heavy-handed kind of villain, um, if you will. He was willing to do whatever was necessary. And so we see Haman uh, installed as the mover and shaker in the kingdom. Can I just say to you tonight, as it relates to insecurities, those who demand that everyone bow down to them often possess the most insecurities. And here's what I have found, and I'm still finding this out, and I have to tell myself it again tonight. The only way to deal with an insecure person who has arrogance and tries to wield that at work or in the community or in the church or wherever is to not bow down, to outlast them, to just stay standing, to stay faithful. And if you'll stay faithful long enough, those insecurities will be exposed. God will resolve the story as we're about to see. Arrogant insecurity requires us to stay standing. All right, then if you will notice, as we mentioned, he installs this man named Haman. And so we find here at the end of verse number one, the last of the important figures or the main cast of the story of Esther. So we've already met Esther and Ahasuerus and Mordecai and the other factors that are involved. And now we see the last major player, if you will, the antagonist, the the villain of the story, which is this man, Haman. Now we see that he is an Agagite. That means he's a descendant of the kings of the Amalekites. So Agag, uh, we'll talk about it more. Remember where Saul has the interaction with Agag and he doesn't handle that situation right? That has some significance here that's really neat to consider. But Agag was actually a title. So Agag, Agag was not a proper name as much as it was the ruler was given this title. He is Agag of the Amalekites. And so Haman is a direct descendant. He has royalty in his blood as it relates to the Amalekites. 
and we see this war between the Amalekites and the Israelites about to resume. In fact, it's interesting, the book of Esther is the last chapter of that battle. Really cool. We'll unpack that a bit in just a moment. But we find Haman here, um, the Amalekite, being revealed in verse 1. All right, verse 2. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. Why? For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. So we see in verse 2 that this, not only was there an arrogant insecurity, number two, jot this down, there was arrogant superiority. Haman thought he was better. He was superior. Um, and, and so his pride uh, demanded, the king, uh, on behalf of him, demanded that all bow to this man. And so we see this battle that's about to begin, this stand that Mordecai must take. And you notice at the end of verse 2 that Mordecai refuses to bow to a mere man. Now, the law of Moses did not, did not say that an Israelite could not bow to another human being. In fact, there are several accounts of that in Scripture where it is not at least directly confronted. You see in 2 Samuel 4, 14, chapter 18 and verse 26, 1 Kings 1, 16, three instances just for example where a Jew bowed down before a dignitary, a king. Here's the problem. To bow before a Persian king based upon their teaching was to say that he was God. That was the difference. And there are actually extra biblical events, the uh, uh, occurrences. Um, One that I read was the Spartans would not bow to Xerxes as well because of the same reason. They refused to say, Xerxes or or Ahasuerus, you are God. And by bowing, Mordecai would have done so. And so it was on moral principle. It was based upon uh, the law and, and the requirement to bow to no one but God himself that caused Mordecai to not pay homage uh, to the king and his command or to this second tier ruler, if you will, named Haman. And so this evening, the thought would be this, to bow, <laughs> to bow down and to worship only God. Listen, this is key. To bow down and worship God only means we stand up to everybody who tries to take his place. So here's the challenge, and I hate to be the bearer of this tough or tough truth tonight. We claim to worship God, but are we standing when others try to take his place in our lives? Through manipulation, through control, through just demanding of us our reverence, uh, no one has the right to occupy that place in our lives besides God. And so to bow down to God, often the way we do that is actually by staying standing Uh, to those who try to uh, supplant him. Uh, And so may we not allow anyone or anything usurp his rightful place uh, in our lives. Don't allow those who worship themselves to go unchecked by you who are called to only worship God. Where and who do you need to stand up to in this way? And so be faithful in that. Don't compromise. Uh, Don't yield to that pressure of the pride of others. Oftentimes, if I'm not careful, I just distance myself from proud people. I just don't like to be around proud people. Um, I like being around myself when I'm proud. I've noticed that. But everybody else, have you noticed that? Pride, when it's your own pride, it's kind of attractive and just makes sense. But everybody else is just, ugh. You know, you just want to push away from that. But sometimes I need to engage with that proud person by not just giving way or backing away. I need to stand up if I'm to be faithful uh, to the Lord. So we see Mordecai not running from the court He just stays, and he stands. And I think sometimes we as God's people need to do that on a more frequent basis. All right, look at verse 3. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, I mean, they've heard what the king said, and everybody's doing it except for Mordecai. said unto Mordecai, why transgressest thou the king's commandment? All right, number two. So stand up in the face of arrogant pressure. Number two, stand up in the face of peer pressure. So not only did he have the pressure from the king and from Haman, but he also had the pressure from everybody else who kept bowing. And, and who knows with Haman? This is me just filling in the gaps. But do you think other, Haman ever just went by the same group twice just to see if they'd bow down again? You know? and, and so here's Haman you know, or Mordecai trying to go about his business, and Haman just does a few extra laps through the court you know, where, where, where folks are just to get a few extra bows his way. And so the peers keep bowing, and yet we see Mordecai willing to stand up in the face of that peer pressure. Um, Any of you parents ever noticed how in the household that foods kind of go through cycles where like something's in high demand and then it's not? 
and there's literally no logical reason. Here's my theory on this. It's only a value if everybody else wants it, okay? And some of you saw this, I think. I forget who shared this with me. But this is just an example of what we navigate as parents. So parenting is this. It's buying four bananas and watching them all get eaten in one day. Then buying eight bananas and watching them rot on your counter because, quote, nobody likes bananas, okay? (laughs) Doesn't that capture it? Heidi will do that. Well, last time we ate two pizzas, so she makes two pizzas, and this time everybody wants two slices or whatever, you know. It's just the, the ups and downs of it, and, and a lot of it's defined by what is everybody else thinking in the household, and, and so this peer pressure that often we navigate, we have to be careful with that to not be found fallen uh, or caving where we need to be standing. All right, notice two things about this pressure. Number one, it is repeated pressure. Did you notice that? Now, when it came, now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not. So they, this wasn't, they said it one time and then backed off. They just kept trying to wear him down. The, the repetitive appeals, come on, Mordecai, what are you doing? What are you thinking? And go with the flow, chill out, whatever the expression would have been. I don't know if chill out was a Persian expression, but whatever it was, just, just come on, go with the flow here. Do, do what's expected of us. Uh, don't make waves. The repeated pressure, they spake daily Unto him. One of the things we have to guard against as faithful Christians, or those of us trying to be better and more faithful as believers, we have to guard against being worn down over time by the repeated appeals and repackaging of our peers that try to convince us it's no longer needed or necessary for us to stand for the Lord. They appeal to our career. They appeal to our feelings. They appeal to our family. What, well, how's this going to affect you and your family and your future? And they seem to be looking out for you, but they're trying to wear you down. Can you think of another man who had to stand through the constant temptation and appeal of another? I was thinking of Joseph in Genesis 39 and verse 10. It says, And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. That's what's amazing about Joseph was his integrity, not just in one moment, but he kept, he kept holding ground. He kept standing where he needed to stand, and ultimately he fled. He did not give in to the repeated pressure. Most of us, where we excuse it away, where we don't stand and we should as well, I tried for a while. No, we have to stand even after the repeated attempts to wear us down in our standing for the Lord. All right, look at the end of verse 4. These same ones who claimed probably early on to have Mordecai's best in mind, notice, after they saw that he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. Number two, jot this down, it is resistible pressure. So it's repeated, but it is resistible. We can resist the pressure of our peers. His resistance (laughs) went on day after day. His fellow court members spoke to him daily. He would not listen to uh, to them. In fact, the word hearken that's found in verse 4 is in the future tense. So it's almost like Haman says, and by the way, not only am I not going to hearken now, I'm never going to hearken. I'm never going to back down. And so they gave up. He had determined that he was going to be faithful, not just in the present tense, but also in the future. So they turn him in, probably to gain favor with Mordecai or with uh, Haman. And so they turn him in to Haman, who now hears of this one who refuses to bow before him. Key thought this evening, and we probably all had this happen in our lives if we've tried to stay faithful. If the world cannot get you to bow out through the we're looking out for your well-being approach, if they can't get you to, to be worn down by that, they will sell you out and they will gang up on you won't they? So initially, hey, I'm looking out for you, and I care about you, and they, they try that approach, and if that doesn't work, then they sell you out, and they gang up on you. Uh, and so we have to be prepared for that, as we see them doing with Mordecai here in chapter 3 of Esther. Now, it's interesting, the very end of verse 4, we see Mordecai got painted in a corner, and he stood up, and then notice this, for he had told them that he was a Jew. This is the first time in years decades of Mordecai's existence and influence and affluence in the Persian Empire that he publicly owns and admits, not just his biological pedigree, but his his relationship with God. He owned that he was a Jew. 
For the first time, we see the mask removed. This man who had spent his entire life hiding his nationality and teaching his cousin to do the same Esther, who is now the queen. I think if you had seen them in that culture, they would have fit completely in. They sounded, they looked, uh, they knew the culture, they knew the lingo, they, they, they had packaged themselves in a way that it was undetectable that they were Jews, that they were followers of Jehovah. And yet something changed when Haman walked into the court and demanded everybody bow. Mordecai had had enough. He was determined to identify with the Lord. Now, can I say to you tonight, if you were to ask me what is the turning point of the book of Esther, most of us would probably go to chapter 4 or 5, where Esther is told, you got to do this, God's put you in the kingdom for such a time as this, that familiar phrase, and maybe when Esther goes to the king and he holds out the scepter, can I submit to you this, this is the turning point of the book. When Mordecai is willing to step up, all the, all the positive consequences that follow are because of this one moment when he decided to come out of the shadows, come out of the deception and the misleading of others, and to own that he was identifying with Jesus Christ. Can I encourage you tonight, your resolve to follow God and to step up for Christ, I don't think we can underestimate the fallout of that. If you and I will just stand, if you and I will just step up, even during threatening seasons, who knows how the story will shift in our families, how the story will shift in our communities, uh, where God will change things if we will just stay standing in the moment of crisis. And by the way, when we stand up for God, he stands with us. They're not just threatening us. They're not just attacking us. They're attacking him, and he will stand with his people, and he will protect us. He will give us the power and the grace that we need. Can I ask you a question tonight? Where could God exert his power if we would not crumble under the pressures that we currently are facing? What if we stop giving up? What if we quit shutting up? What if we quit just backing off and calming down and going with the flow? What could God do through us? Esther, the rest of the story, is really the answer to that question. And it doesn't just have to be the story of Esther. It can be ours as well. All right. Let's go now to verse number five and look at a second threat, the more ratcheted up threat that the rest of the book will be unraveling or uh, mitigating uh, with God's uh, providence and sovereign will being done. Look, if you will, at verse five. So they tell Haman um, of what's going on here. And notice verse five, when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not. So it's very likely that he hadn't noticed this one man, singular figure standing to the exception of the rest, for some reason, with probably the throng and the crowd and the fact that Haman himself had not even instituted this command. Now he knows, and he notices that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then was Haman full of wrath. Verse 6, he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. That wasn't enough to him. For they had showed him the people of Mordecai when Haman sought to destroy all the, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of the Hasuerus, excuse me, even the people of Mordecai. All right, let's talk about a second threat. Number two, the threat of annihilation. So the threat of pressure, arrogant pressure, peer pressure. Number two, let's talk about the threat of annihilation. My boys uh, play basketball. They've got a week left of their season. And one of the things that was not in place when I was playing basketball was they have a rule that if one team gets up on the other team by 35 points or more, and we've had a few of those games, my boys would not like that I just told you that, where we are, we are the one down by 35 or more, the clock goes to a running clock. Like it doesn't stop for anything, even free throws, it just keeps going. It's like a mercy rule kind of, which I like in one way, but I don't like in another way. Um, and it's like, basically, you guys are getting annihilated. Let's get this over as quickly as possible, right? Let's just put you out of your misery. That's kind of how it feels when you're on the receiving end of that, the threat of annihilation. Um, and just seeing this even this past week fleshed out has been profound. But can I give you a thought tonight before we talk about this? One of the greatest challenges of us being God's people is this. Living in a hostile <laughs> world is this. Here's the challenge. Standing when it feels like our very survival requires us to run for our lives. Do you resonate with that? Does that resonate with you? 
So I'm supposed to stay here while everything is coming at me and mine, and I want to run. I want to hunker down. I want to find some remote wherever and just get away from it all. When much of the commands God has given clearly tell me I need to stay here. I need to stand up here. And so uh, what do we do? How do we we stand when we're being threatened that we're going to be annihilated? We want to run. We want to bolt. We want to... Uh, we want to run as far away from that place and that situation, yet many times God calls us to stay and to stand. All right, let's talk about a couple ways in which Mordecai navigates this or has to more navigate this, and we do as well. Number one, stand up in the face of raging. We notice the rage here, raging annihilation. The rage um, that we see in the heart of Haman. Two of them. Number one, there we see clearly a racist, we see racism clearly here, a racist rage. A lot of racism is talked about and bannered around. This is real racism here. Um, This was not something that just because Mordecai was unwilling to bow, that wasn't what lit the fuse here. This had been steeped into the family. This had been a part of Haman's upbringing from the beginning. So the moment he has an opening, he seizes it to attack this race called the Jewish people. Haman here in his egotism and his pride and seeing the disrespect of Mordecai determines to not just snuff him out, but to snuff out everybody that uh, is a part of the Jewish race. Um, and one of the things I have found to be true in my, in my time of trying to stand at different times, either in this church or other ministry things or family things or whatever the case may be, is that when we stand for the Lord, We have to be prepared for the fact that people try to overwhelm us, listen, by overreacting. Is this an overreaction? Yeah, beyond reason, right? So one of the ways that the enemy, whether it's Satan himself or the world or our own flesh or other people's flesh, is they try to intimidate us by overreacting. Like, what in the, where did that come from? All I said was this, or I I refuse to do that. And that their, their agenda is to overwhelm us, so therefore we will cave where we are trying to stand with conviction. And so the overreaction of Haman is, is the playbook 101 uh, of our enemies through all, all of human history and church history. Is they try to overwhelm us by overreacting uh, to a simple stand that we hold to, like we see Mordecai doing here uh, in this chapter. All right, verse 7. In the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pure, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month, to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. And so Haman here is so careless with the Jewish people's lives that he gambles, he casts lots to determine when he will execute them, uh, when he will uh, wipe them off the face of the map, and he does, a map, and he does so very carelessly and flippantly and the casting of the lots called the pure, which later will be the Purim um, that we'll see in the feast that celebrate after God delivers his people. Um, And so he uses this lot to determine the date of execution. And as we see as a result, it is 11 months hence from this day that's referenced here will be the day uh, of judgment, the day of execution. Now, Haman probably thought, I like that. It's 11 months away. They're going to suffer and sweat it out and dread it. But it's interesting. Why do you think it was 11 months? Why not tomorrow or next month? Do you think maybe God was involved in this? Like 11 months, we're going to read about what happened during those 11 months. And it's amazing that God gave them this margin they needed when the enemy was raging and overreacting. God was at work. Uh, even that situation. Proverbs, let's look at it. Proverbs 16, just for a moment. This would be one verse that would maybe allude to God's hand in the book of Esther, even though we don't see his name mentioned in all of the book. Proverbs 16, just a quick back a few chapters there. Uh, it's chapter 16 of Proverbs in verse 33. Uh, the lot was also used um, in Acts chapter 1, remember, to pick a replacement for Judas Iscariot. Um, whether Peter had instruction from God to do that or not, that's open maybe for some discussion. But uh, God is in the lot. And look here in verse 33 of Proverbs 16, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. 
So God was a part of these little, however it looked, we don't know exactly what the lots would have looked like, but Haman just tossed them on the table and God arranged them. Um, Again, looking out for his people, even in the midst of all that was going on in this moment, God uh, was providing for his people. Chance did not determine the date, God did. And even though the story does not mention his name anywhere in the book of Esther, it reveals his will. God delayed the date for 11 months to give his plan time to unfold. So here's the thought. If we will just stay standing, God will take care of resolving everything. Our job is to not start overanalyzing and trying to fix everything or analyze everything. Our job is just to stand and having done all to stand. Ephesians 6 is clear on that. That's our job. God will take care of the timing and the resolution and everything that's attached to it. One author said this in reference to this verse, even superstition was changed, chained to divine chariot wheels. Even the superstition of this moment and, and him being very careful to let the lots determine the date, um, it was chained to the divine chariot wheels of our God. All right, verse 8. And Haman, all right, so he's got the, the, the attack mode, and now he goes to the power broker, to Ahasuerus himself. Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, there's a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws. And he's thinking, I'm sure, of the one violated by Mordecai in reference to himself. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. It's not for the king's prophet. Verse 9, if it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those who have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasury. So in verse 8, we see Haman now approaching the king to have him sign off on this attack and annihilation of the Jewish people. And what does he do? He misrepresents them and says they are a threat to the kingdom, right? So he's, he's misrepresenting them to the king. I, the king was married to a Jew and didn't realize it right now in this moment. He didn't know much probably about their culture or their beliefs, but Uh, Haman, he trusted him, and so Haman misrepresents them and says they are a threat to your kingdom. They must be uh, removed. Mark it down. Those who stand up for God in a world filled with rebels will be demonized. Um, You ever been demonized? That's no fun, is it? How do you defend yourself against that? Uh, And so we see here, uh, again, the tried and true methods of uh, our enemies. If we stand for God, Our motives will be questioned. Our motives will be maligned. We will ultimately be demonized. That's what justifies their attack then against us. All right, and then in verse 9, as we just read, Haman, almost as if he's not sure the king will go along with, he adds some incentive. Uh, He obviously has some wealth here at his disposal. Um, Best accounts that I could figure, it's likely Haman offered $20 million in today's currency to pay uh, for what he was about to do to the, to the Jewish people. The logistics of it, the costing of it, uh, he was willing to fund it from his own coffers. He hated the Jews so much, he was willing to spend $20 million to annihilate them uh, as a nation. And so we see this great racist rage leveled against Mordecai and his people. Now, just a word of context. I alluded to this a moment ago. But we read Haman's name and his pedigree or his background in verse number one, that he is an Agagite. And as I alluded to briefly a moment ago, Haman uh, is a descendant of Agag, the king of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were the most ancient of the Hebrew enemies. This went back all the way to Exodus 17. You could read on your own time uh, as the Amalekites uh, caused grief to the Israelites at Rephidim. And Moses even identifies them in that text as being instruments of the devil. He identifies them as such that the devil is using them. And after defeating the Amalekites in the wilderness in Exodus 17, God promises that he will blot out the remembrance of Amalek, and there will be this ongoing struggle uh, from generation to generation. Now, here's where the interesting part comes in. Uh, Go back to chapter 1. Let me set the table quickly. And you notice, I'm sorry, chapter 2, it mentions the pedigree of Mordecai, all right? Go down to verse 5. Now in Shushan the palace, the power central uh, 
uh, place of the king and soon Haman, but Mordecai is here in chapter 2, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. You remember me talking about last week that that puts Mordecai as a distant relative of what king of Israel? Saul. What's interesting, as you know, is you're probably connecting the dots in your own mind and heart. God had told King Saul to blot out whom? The Amalekites. And remember, he saves all the, 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 the cattle, everything of value and wealth in that economy, and then he saves the king, Agag. Haman is a descendant of Agag. Saul, I'm sorry, Mordecai is a descendant of Saul. And so here we have, in chapter 3 of Esther, it's unbelievable, I don't think I've ever seen this, this connection before, we have the last battle between the Amalekites and the Israelites. And just like they got beat and thrashed the first time, they're going to have it again here in just a few chapters. But there's this ongoing battle. And here's what I want to encourage you with tonight. This battle we're in is bigger than us. It's been going on forever, and it's going to keep going on until Jesus comes. So why not just stand in the generation we're in and do what's right instead of cutting some corners like Saul? And Mordecai earlier in the chapter was tempted to do, the earlier in the story. Stand, be faithful, let God accomplish his will that's bigger than you and me. And the moment that Mordecai encountered Haman in Susa, in Shushan, was more than about two men meeting in this place of power. It wasn't good guy versus bad guy. This is bigger than that. It was the collision, listen to me, of 10 centuries of, of racism and hatred and friction that Mordecai, when he stood, he enlisted again in that battle to which God would ultimately be conqueror. And so may we be faithful to stand for the Lord in our generation. Listen, the pressure is not random. The, ple- the pressure is not just coming out of nowhere. It's a spiritual battle. It's been going on and will keep going on. That's why we stand. Um, one of the things I've been struck by is I've been listening to interviews of not just the hung- or, um, of the Ukrainian people and of those in that immediate area, is other people, especially us from the West. And they're like, we just can't believe this would happen in 2022. Like, they, they, it just blows their mind because we all love each other and we all think the same and we all get along. We're all citizens of the world. They can't process that there's real battle going on. And I just want to remind you, we know we should not be naive in that, not just in a political sense, but in a spiritual sense. And Ephesians reminds us of that, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's going to go on and on and on until Jesus comes back. And so if there's a battle going on, the best position to be in in that battle that we know we're in is to be standing. And Ephesians says that over and over, and having done all to stand, 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 stand. And so may we, in the midst of racist rage, it's bigger than just skin, melatonin levels. It's, it's bigger than that. It's anti-Semitic. It's, it's against Christ and against our God. May we be faithful to stand with him. All right, go to verse 10 now. And the king took his ring from his hand, gave it to Haman, all right, his pet project here, the son of of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. So now he's being identified as that. That's added to his, his, um, his uh, resume, if you will. He is identified as that. And the king said to Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Number two, jot, <laughs> jot this down. Not only we see racist rage, we see reckless rage. Reckless rage. Ahasuerus just casually seals this death sentence with his ring, sentencing not just innocent men, but women and children. Um, He does so carelessly, all on the altar of Haman's pride. Um, Verse 11 seems to indicate that Haman will get the benefit of whatever plunder and spoil is taken from the Jewish people, maybe to repay him for his investment. Uh, So it's very calloused, it's very reckless, it's very uh, casual how they approach the suffering of God's people. All right, go down if you will. Uh, Let's read them quickly. Then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded, uh, the king's lieutenants and the governors that were over every province and the rulers of every people of every province, 
according to the writing thereof, and every people after their language. So this spreads to all people in the kingdom. In the name of King Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. And letters were sent by post unto all the king's provinces to, de- to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for prey. A copy of the writing <laughs> for the commandment was to be given to every province, and it was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. The post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the tree was given in Shushan, the palace. And so you see them delivering uh, this notice to all of the kingdom. Their thoroughness, the translating into different languages, they're making sure that no province misses out on this, and we miss some of these Jews. The thoroughness, the recklessness um, of this moment. Now, notice the end of the chapter, and then we'll get to chapter 4 for just a moment, the first couple of verses. It says this, And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. Isn't that just so calloused? They've just sentenced thousands and thousands of innocents to death, and they just tip their glass and share a moment of reckless rage and carelessness, no value for human life, a disdain for the Jewish people and the bloodbath that was about to follow. The carelessness, the flippancy of these two men. One of the things I've noticed about threats from those around us, that often it is the shadow of fear, not the substance of fear that, that looms largest. And by that I mean this, a lot of times the things we fear, it's more the shadow of it, like the what ifs of it, than the actual threat that intimidates us. And this is casting a pretty long shadow here. I mean, they're, they're going out 11 months, here's what's going to happen, and who's, here's who's going to die. And can I encourage you, even when the shadows loom large and long, Stay standing. There, there's more going on. There, there's something substantive that God is about to do. Don't let the shadows of fears cause you to back away or to balk where you need to be faithful uh, to stand for the Lord. To stand up to those in power in our day requires us to stay standing during the shadow of their threat. God will take it from there. Our job is just to stand. One commentator said this of, of the end of the chapter here. He said this, here was the situation where a king and his high minister were an erring minority with extensive authority. Does that sound familiar? An erring minority. There's so few, and yet they had extensive authority. But all people, nations, and individuals alike must reckon with the highest authority, which is God. The king's decree was issued and posted, but the king of kings would have the last word, right? And I mentioned to you when we began this story, it's interesting, the very apparatus that was used to publish this notice would be the same sophisticated system that would be used to let the Jews know you can defend yourselves. So even this thing that seemed like they had so much power, the power of media, this is media in this day, that very thing could be turned on its head to say, you're free to defend yourself. You're free to stand in the name of Jehovah and claim his promises of deliverance in the face of this attack. And so do see beyond the shadows cast by the rage of man. Let the heathen rage. Let the heathen rage. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he wants. And God can use the wrath of men to please him, including the wrath directed at you and the wrath directed at me. It can still bring him glory as we're about to see in the story. All right. Number two, and lastly, jot this down. Stand up in the face of mournful annihilation, mournful annihilation. Go to chapter 4, and let's just just peek into this chapter. We'll study most of it next time. Verse 4, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes. So all the city is perplexed, especially, obviously, those that were Jews and those who were friends of Jews and associates, maybe business partners, maybe married in in some way in this kind of plural uh, society. But the place is in chaos as they process this random command. And now in chapter 1, or chapter 4 and verse 1, we see Mordecai processing. He rent his clothes, put on sackcloth with ashes, went out in the midst of the city and cried with a loud voice and a bitter cry. Um, desperate. Verse 2, and it came even before the king's gate, and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth, and in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. 
So standing up in the face of mournful annihilation. Um, someone was sharing me, with me this the other day. For those of us who are bookworms, some of you haven't read a book since you were born, okay? And that's okay. Someday you'll see the light, okay? But a lot of us, we enjoy reading. And um, I don't know about you, I have this tension with books. So I get a really good book. Have you ever had that book that just, it's like a page turner? You read, you want to just blitz through the thing in one evening or stay up all night or whatever. Some of us nerds at least. But here's the bad thing. When you find a good book and you're reading it, you love it, but you also if I keep reading, it's going to end. You know what I mean? So you're kind of that tension of, for some, just nod your head, okay? Pretend you know I'm talking. Yeah, Josh is, yeah. He's even pursing his lips. Wow, that's good. That, that's, that's a tell, by the way, all right? But anyway, it's, it's almost like if I read further, I'm going to, yeah, I want to know the end, but then it's over. You know one of the things about the story of God is that when we get to the end of the story, it doesn't end on a downer. Here it's a downer, right? Chapter 4 and verse 1 to 3, wailing. I mean, we can't imagine. I mean, imagine coming home and getting the, hey, how'd your day go? <laughs> and then you share what you heard. The, the despair, the, the chaos, the, the just shrieking and, shra- and, ye- and uh, yelling and all that went with that, I'm sure it was a part of this moment. But may I remind you, there's more going on here. And so it ends uh, not with mourning, but with rejoicing. All right, two things about the morning, and we're done. Number one, associating mourning associating mourning. Now here, this is key. In verse 1 and in verse 3, we see Mordecai associating with his people and their plight, possibly for the first time. He is mourning about what they're mourning about. He is broken about what they're broken about. And he is doing so in a very demonstrative way. He's associating with God's people, just like Moses choosing not to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but to identify with the suffering of God's people. Uh, and so we see Mordecai associating with his people, possibly in a, in a public way for the first time as he walked the streets and was broken and mourning and remorseful of what, think about this, his stand had really led to this moment, humanly speaking. Him standing instead of bowing, it led to all these things, and now he is, in one sense, from his view, I'm sure, the cause of now all that is about to happen uh, to his people. May I say tonight, there is always sadness where evil reigns, and we see that clearly in this, uh, this Persian empire. We, in the midst of that evil reign, the sadness it produces, must be willing to stand with God's people in their darkest hour. Like, if we're unwilling to be called the people of God when things are going well, we're going to miss out on a lot of the moments that we're called to be the people of God. Um, This was the hour, this was the moment for Mordecai to associate uh, with his people. All right, and then back to verse 2, you'll notice one consequence of this. It says, And came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. So there is also a disassociating mourning. He disassociated himself from the king's gate gate. By wearing this garb, by lamenting uh, the plight of the Jews and what he was wearing, he was not allowed to hold the position he had held for so long. He was willing to distance himself from others to associate with God. Just a question I would give you kind of as we bring this to conclusion tonight. What are you going to do when you have your Mordecai moment? I think that's a question we all need to ask. When the moment comes and I either cave and bow with everybody around me or I stand, what are we going to do? And may I say to you tonight, if we wait until the moment, we will bow. We must prepare for that moment. We must prepare to resist. We must prepare to not comply. We must prepare for that by pondering the example found in the text tonight. What are you going to do when the Mordecai moment comes in your life? All right, I want to show you one last picture, and this would dovetail. Maybe you've seen this picture before. I've seen it, but didn't know all the backstory to it. Um, I think in some ways this was a Mordecai moment uh, in World War II, early on in the Nazis' ascent to power. But in the picture, you'll see in the middle with the circle around it, the crossed arms of a man named August Landmesser. Um, (laughs) This black and white photo was taken at a 1936 Nazi rally in Hamburg, Germany, and you see him standing in a sea of Nazi loyalists. Hitler has just, present, has just come to christen a new Navy vessel. Hundreds of arms are extended in his direction. Hail Hitler, except for one. 
26-year-old Land Messer was the lone German worker who refused to, refused to salute. He wasn't always a dissident, the article said I was reading. He initially identified himself as a member of the Nazi party. For two years, he displayed no disloyalty. But then he met Irma Eckler in 1933. Their love story had one drawback. Eckler was Jewish. The party revoked his membership and denied him a marriage license. In late 1935, the couple had a child. By the time the 1936 photo was taken, Hitler's anti-Semitism was well known. Is it any wonder that Landmesser refused to salute? He had fallen in love with a Jewish woman, being refused the right to marry her and fathered a half-Jewish daughter. The couple tried to leave Germany for Denmark in 1937. He was detained at the border, so this had been after this picture, for, quote, dishonoring the race, end quote. Authorities told Landmesser to stop seeing Eckler, which he refused to do. Both were arrested in 1938. He was sent to a concentration camp. She went to prison where she gave birth to their second daughter. They never saw each other again. She died in 1942. He was drafted for the war in 1944. Afterwards, shortly, he was declared MIA. And my question to you tonight is, was it worth it, his stand? There are a lot of people on that day, even years afterwards, probably even into the 50s, would have said this was a really foolish stand, reckless, wasted. But I don't know anybody else in that crowd, and this is a zoomed in. There are thousands of people here. He's the one we remember, right? Landmesser. Many times our stand for God is evaluated only in the immediate. And I just want to try to challenge you as we see clearly the book of Esther, I think, is trying to help us is how's this going to age? The compromises will be regrettable. I'm telling you within weeks or months or years at most. Standing for Christ at work, at home, in the community, and into the future, whatever it has the future involves for us, we will not regret that. It will age well, and it will bring greater glory and honor to our God. And so Mordecai's stand here invites us as well to take a stand where God has called us to. Jot this statement down, and we'll, we'll close. Living, jot this down, living as a person of faith in a faithless world requires acts of resistance. Living as a person of faith in a faithless world requires acts of resistance. And here's where I'm concerned. If I were to ask you, when's the last time you acted in resistance? If we don't have them, it's not because we shouldn't be doing them. It's because we're just not doing them. Um, we live in a broken, fallen, compromising world. It ought to be a regular habit of ours that we're standing with Christ lovingly, graciously, but sorry, this is a non-negotiable. I, I have to stand here. I can't bow with you. I can't bend with you. I can't fudge the corners or shave off the edges. I must adhere to what God's word has clearly dictated to me as a follower of him. And there are all kinds of examples coming out of Ukraine um, You've probably seen some of them. I love the statement. One of our guys in our, gro our discipleship group this morning mentioned it. But the president of uh, Ukraine was offered a ride out. Did you see that but from our country, which I'm glad they're at least you know, supporting him in, in that way. But he said, the fight is here. I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. Like, I I'm, I'm staying here. I'm standing here. Many of us want the ride out. We want the, the exit strategy. What if we didn't spend so much time talking about exit strategies and how to negotiate, and we just said, how are we going to stand? How are we going to be faithful? How are we going to be faithful? Um, last one, someone said this, if Russia lays down its weapons, there is no war. I was talking with John, his, him being the red-blooded, gun-toting American that he is. Somebody said this, if Russia lays down its weapons, there is no war. If Ukraine lays down its weapons, there's no more Ukraine. And that, that's, I think, what we need to remember tonight. We've got to stand. Okay, let's just own that. Let's identify that. Let's be faithful as the Lord gives us his grace. Here's the question. We allow God to supernaturally help you step up for his glory, even in seasons that involve threatening pressure and even the threat of annihilation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight.